This is the second portion of the first lecture, in which we will talk about various research designs. The three different scientific methods or research designs that we will talk about in this lecture are as follows. The observational method, the correlational method, finally, the experimental method. Before we really get into it, it is very important to remember, or just know, that each of these methods has their own strengths and weaknesses. This does not mean that one is greater than another. There is a common misconception that experimental methods are somehow more valid or approach the truth more so than the other two methods. This is erroneous. Ultimately, each has their own uses. A good common example would be hammers and screwdrivers can both be used to join two pieces of wood together, say if one was building a bookshelf. It's just the manner in which you go about attaching those two pieces of wood together are different. Each has certain strengths and weaknesses, and that is the same of these three methodologies. Starting with the observational method. This is a, te a technique, excuse me, whereby a researcher observes people, or non-humans for that matter, and systematically records measurements or impressions about their behavior. We will discuss three forms of this method. First is just observations in regard to some existing hypothesis, followed by ethnographies and archival analysis. Observation centered around specific hypotheses. In such cases, the researcher already has a specific hypothesis in mind and will often look for predefined behaviors. In such cases of observation, interjudge reliability, which is also sometimes referred to as interrater reliability, is of utmost importance. This means that you have multiple judges who are all observing the same phenomena, and then their level of agreement is measured. So an example of this would be if a researcher was interested in the number of aggressive versus altruistic acts school children perform over, let's say, a week, they might use such a method. Now here, in order to have high interjudge or interrater reliability, one would have multiple judges observing these children, each coding independently how many aggressive acts and how many altruistic acts they witnessed. Afterwards, they would get together and they would compare how many behaviors each of them saw along with which behaviors specifically were classified as aggressive or altruistic. And certain times they will be high levels of agreement and other times they will not be, depending on the sort of specificity of the behaviors being witnessed and the preconceived notions of the judges themselves. Now, unfortunately, there is no standard across the field of what counts as a just the right amount or better of interjudge reliability. And often this is left to the readers to establish whether it is high enough that they will believe, let's say, the results found. Ethnographies are a method by which researchers attempt to understand some group or culture by observing it from the inside sort of within that group or culture. This is kind of, you can imagine, they go on a undercover mission, if you will. It is vitally important in this method that researchers refrain from imposing any preconceived notions that they might have on those who they are observing. Now, this is something that is relatively easy to say and makes a lot of sense on the face of it, but it is incredibly hard to actually achieve this for human beings. There are some forms of training that one can receive for this type of observation, but at the end of the day, trying to keep our pre-existing knowledge from biasing how we look at the world is incredibly difficult. I'm imagining, at least in this class in particular, many of you are likely to be liberals, even though some are maybe conservatives, and just imagine the opposite side for a second and your general ideas of what those people look like. Chances are, you have all kinds of different images of what people of that group appear to be. Yet many of us will have actually met individuals from these opposing groups who don't actually fit with our original preconceived notions. Yet we're continually surprised when such a thing happens. That surprise is the product of us not being able to keep our preconceived notions from being overlaid upon the people that we meet in our daily lives. It is also very important to remember 
that a different group or culture need not be geographically far away. For example, for us in the United States, I don't need to travel all the way to Japan just to see a different culture. Almost all cultures across the world can be further divided into subcultures. For example, we could look at, and it is commonly used, that Californians are different than the United States as a whole. And even within California, those who live in the Bay Area are oftentimes a different group compared to California as a whole. You could continue to go further and further. What matters is rather that there is some way to define what culture one is looking at and a way to contrast this with across or with different cultures. I highly recommend reading the example about the seekers in the book just to show how one can perform an ethnography in a non-ethnically different culture. It is also just a fascinating story and we will talk much more about the phenomena when we start talking about cognitive dissonance in several chapters. Finally, we have archival analysis, and this is a form of observational method in which researchers examine the accumulated documents of a specific culture. These documents could include things such as diaries, novels, magazines, newspapers, television shows, internet posts, what have you. Now, please note that just because archival is in the name of this form of analysis does not mean that the documents being analyzed must be ancient. In fact, Analyzing internet posts from the last month would also fall under this type of methodology. There are, however, some limitations with the observational method. One of the primary limitations is that this method does not allow researchers to answer questions about why something happens. For example, think back to when the researchers were observing those children's angry or altruistic behaviors in their school setting. It does not allow one to explain why those children are behaving the actions that they are behaving. One might have conjecture as to what the reasons are, but ultimately this method does not allow us to answer those questions. Further, this method is generally not suited to observe rare events such as emergencies or private behaviors such as one's personal kinks or sexual behavior. You can just imagine how strange it would be if someone was always watching you whenever you were in the privacy of your own home. And to know when accidents were going to happen, I would imagine that those people would make much more money being able to predict horrible things from happening and preventing them than actually going into research where oftentimes one is not paid very much. Further, this method does not allow researchers to know about the effects of observed behaviors on subsequent attitudes and behaviors. For example, while I might watch certain children perform aggressive actions, I don't know what are the long-term consequences this is going to have on their future development, their future aggressive behaviors, and the development of the child who was ultimately the victim of those aggressive behaviors. This method does not allow us to know such things. While it is possible to have very long-term observational studies, oftentimes they are not conducted in such a way that every moment of a person's life is recorded, and thus one can, generally speaking, not know about the long-term effects of the behaviors witnessed in an observational study. Further, this is also true of certain types of archival analysis in specific. I can, for example, look at how many sex-related posts were posted on the internet across the entirety of the state of California in the last three months. But this does not allow me to know what are the effects of all of those posts pertaining to sexual behavior that were uploaded over that time frame. Next, moving on to the correlational method. Correlational method is oftentimes associated with the, statistic, the statistical technique excuse me, of calculating correlations. Basically, in this method, you take two or more variables and you systematically measure them and then you quantify the relationship between them. Whenever we're talking about a relationship in scientific methods in general or specifically in statistics, what we're talking about is the degree to which knowledge about one variable can then be used to make predictions about other variables. Now, the metric that is oftentimes used is the correlation coefficient. This is a statistic that assesses the strength of a correlation or a relationship. Please note that correlation coefficients are bounded. This means that they can only have a specific range of values, and this range is between negative 1 and 1.
If you ever find a correlation that is beyond this range, some mathematical error has been performed, and worse, the people who are doing it don't know what they're doing. But much more common is that a mathematical error was performed. Now, it is exceedingly unlikely, if not impossible, in all the years that I have been doing research and all of my mentors combined, I don't think any one of them has come across a correlation coefficient of one, or negative one that, for that matter. Basically, what a correlation coefficient of one, or again, negative one, means or indicates is that perfect prediction is possible. Thus, knowing any value on one variable would allow you to perfectly predict the value on a second or third variable that is related to it. Now, here are some images showing different types of correlations. So starting with the top left image, you see a strong positive correlation of 0.9. Really, the main takeaway here is that this line represents the line of best fit. If you'd like to look into it more, you could look at least sums of squares lines. It is related to regression. What matters the most for the idea of this strong correlation is that most of the dots, which represent the individual data points, are very close to the line in space. Now, it is a positive correlation because it moves from the lower left quadrant towards the top right quadrant. And what this indicates is as one variable increases in value, so too does the other variable. Moving one window over to the right, you see a weak positive correlation of 0.6. Now here again, you see a line of best fit that has been drawn through the data, and it follows the same general pattern moving from the bottom left quadrant to the top right quadrant, but here most of the individual data points are more spread out along this line. Basically, this is showing an increased amount of noise in our data, or the chances of a higher rate of prediction errors once we're trying to make predictions based on one known variable onto the unknown variable. Moving into the middle, you have a no correlation or a correlation of zero. Uh, another fun way of thinking about this is simply your data represents a cloud of gnats. Here, no best fit line is drawn. A lot of the reason for that would just be that no line would have any meaning in regard to this data. And another way of thinking about this is that there is no relationship between the two variables. What that means is, while having knowledge on one variable, it does not allow you to make any type of meaningful prediction about the second variable. Moving down into the bottom left-hand corner, just a quick note, this is a strong negative correlation and they have it indicated as negative one. This is not a negative one correlation because all dots would be exactly on the line if that was the case. Chances are this is very close and got rounded to negative one. Anyhow, you see that the pattern of dots across the line is very similar to the positive correlation that is very strong, indicating that most individual data points are very close to this best fit line. What makes it a negative correlation is that it moves from the top left quadrant of the graph to the bottom right quadrant of the graph. What this means in actual practice is as the values of one variable increase, so too do the, or not so too, excuse me, as the values of one variable increase, then the corresponding values of the related variable will tend to decrease. Basically, as one goes up, the other will go down. Finally, in the bottom right graph, you see a weak negative correlation. It again is a sense of weakness related to the positive one, such that the individual data points are more spread out around this line. And it is negative because it moves from the top left quadrant into the bottom right quadrant. If you feel still uncomfortable with correlations, I highly recommend for you reading a chapter in a statistics book. I'm happy to provide one if you need. But beyond that, you will not actually have to calculate these in these class, so you needn't worry about that too much. What's more important is that you understand the general principles behind what correlations mean, such that if I say something like the number of people witnessing events are negatively correlated with helping behaviors, you will know what that means. One of the primary ways in which data is acquired for the correlational method is through the use of surveys. Now, while many are probably familiar with what surveys are, surveys refer to research in which some representative sample is asked questions about their attitudes and their behaviors.
Now, one of the advantages of this is oftentimes that most surveys allow for responses to be anonymous, which allows them to answer, generally speaking, questions that they would not often answer in a situation in which it was known who they were. Now, surveys allow researchers to establish the relationship between variables that are oftentimes difficult to observe, partly because of the anonymous nature of them. Basically, what this means is that participants are often more readily willing to answer questions. For example, if a random researcher in a white lab coat approached you and wanted to know the intricacies of your personal life, let's say your either ideologies relating to political affiliation, even though some are willing to talk about that, or let's say your sexual proclivities, which also some are willing to talk about this, though most are socialized not to speak about these things in public. Therefore, the use of surveys that one can answer in private and are assured that the answers will remain anonymous, people are much more likely to answer questions about these types of variables. Additionally, surveys allow for sampling representative segments of a population of interest. What this means is it allows you to ask questions of a group or subset of the population that approximates the population as a whole along vital metrics. So a big one of this, for example, in the United States would be race or ethnicity. If you were to ask only one subset of these ethnicities or races in this country about certain ideals that they held, you would be ignoring other sections of the population itself, and all answers you got from this biased sample would not do a very good job of reflecting the overall population's ideologies. Here we have something called random sampling, which is used to allow us to get closer and closer to a representative sample. Now, a survey is only as good or useful as the quality of the sample used to perform the survey. In fact, there are many historical examples of how data acquired through surveys have been grossly inaccurate. There's an interesting question or I guess illustration in your textbook about how a certain magazine got it horribly wrong when predicting who would be the next president. In fact, many of us saw this in the previous election cycle. Now, random sampling or random selection is a way of ensuring that a sample of people is representative of a population by giving everyone in the population an equal chance of being selected. Now, this is an ideal, and thus variations on this have been developed to deal with practical considerations. For example, if I wanted to know, let's say, how tall human beings were in the continental United States, well, I would need a way of being able to contact, in an equally likely way, every single person living in the continental United States. How would you go about doing this? Would you use DMV records? Well, not everyone is registered with the DMV. Would you use tax returns? Well, not everybody filed their taxes. How would you go about it? Would you use a phone book landline directory? Well, many people no longer have landlines. Would you use just cell phone directories? Well, some people only have landlines. Now, you can just see that it begins to become incredibly difficult to truly give every single person an equal chance of being selected. Therefore, we oftentimes use approximations of this sampling methodology, which you can look into more on your own time. Now, a representative sample just means a sample that matches a population of interest along most dimensions or qualities. This means that if on average there are certain percentages of European Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, and so on in the population as a whole, that the samples that I use should reflect those same types of ethnic or racial breakdowns. Now, it is also important to note that while this is an ideal many people strive to, it is often not the case. In fact, much psychological research has been done in historically European American universities and specifically on college student undergraduates who are psychology majors. Now, in some ways, this has led to okay predictions, but in a lot of times, it raises the question of how representative are those samples to the population of the United States as a whole. 
When it comes to the accuracy of responses in surveys, this is another potential limitation, along with the types of samples used, of the use of surveys. Now, the most common thought when one comes across thinking about the accuracy of surveys is that people are prone to lying. And this does happen. It's not like no one ever lies. It would be, I honestly think, a strange world if that was the case. But nonetheless, it's actually not that widespread. Many people are prone to honest responses in surveys. The much more insidious impact pertains to participants' ability to accurately infer their own mental states and the causes of their behaviors. Many of us have explanations or reasons why we do things, but those reasons need not actually be the original causes of our behavior. In fact, there is a relatively large body of literature that shows that we're actually not very good at being able to identify the true causes of our behavior due to multiple reasons. There are ultimately, like it says, limits to what we can know about ourselves. So I will place an article by Nisbet and Wilson, which is mentioned in this text on iLearn, just so you can look through it. It is about the limits of what we can know. Nisbet and Ross have also written an excellent book on the subject titled Human Inference, Strategies and Shortcomings of Social Judgment. For those of you who want to embark on a somewhat dense read, but I feel is ultimately invaluable to our understanding of ourselves and other people, it is definitely worth it. One can find old used copies for relatively cheap. An example just to illustrate this would be imagine a real world trolley problem. So for those of you who don't know, the trolley problem is a philosophical question that states, you are standing in some form and able to witness a track, a train track, on which there are five workers who are working, and all of them are, let's say, wearing headphones and thus are not able to hear anything. And you see an out of control railway car barreling down the track towards them. Now, there is a lever right next to you that would allow you to switch the track on which this train is moving, but if you do so, it will run over a single person on the second track who also cannot hear the trolley coming. And so the real question is, do you do nothing and let those five people die, or do you pull the lever and kill one person to save those five? Now, this has been debated, and there are many forms of this problem, and we could sit for several hours even and discuss this back and forth and back and forth, and what if they were strangers, what if they were not, what if one of your family members was there, what if it was a heinous criminal, and so on and so forth. But the truth is, and if you're truly honest with yourself, can you really know what you would do in a situation in real life that arose similar to this type of problem? And many of us will come up with explanations and ideas of what we will do, but the truth is, until reality hits, very few of us will actually know what we will do. So, the correlational method is also not without its limitations. The core limitation of this method is its inability to determine causal relationships or pathways. What this means is, just because two variables are related or linked together does not mean that they are causally tied to one another. It is inappropriate to assume that one variable causes another, no matter how plausible that explanation might seem. There is a common saying that many of you have probably come across, which states that correlation does not prove or imply causation. Now, before going into this moment of thought, uh, the most common example that gets used is boating accidents and ice cream sales. So boating accidents and ice cream sales are positively correlated, such that as ice cream sales go up, so too do boating accidents. Now, ice cream sales do not cause boating accidents, and boating accidents do not cause ice cream sales. In fact, there is a third variable related to both, which is the time of year, or the temperature of the day, as you could say. As it is summertime and there are warmer days, more people ride boats, leading to greater numbers of accidents, and more people buy ice cream in the summer. This is what drives the relationship between these two things. If you would like to see some fun and hilarious correlations, I believe there is a website called spuriouscorrelation.com, which shows you all kinds of wild correlations. Now, coming back to this thinking moment, so I have told you that correlation does not prove or imply causation. But does causation prove or imply correlation? 
I will leave you with that. Moving on to the experimental method. This method is the only one that provides us a way of determining causal relationships. Now, the experimental method involves two specific variables, the independent variable, which is the variable a researcher changes or varies to see if it has an effect on some other variable, oftentimes the dependent variable. And a dependent variable is the variable that a researcher measures to see if it was influenced by that independent variable according to whatever hypothesis the researcher came up with. It is possible that it changes in a way that the researcher did not hypothesize, but then it does not speak to the original hypothesis that was generated by the researcher. Please note that it is also possible to have multiple independent and dependent variables, and we just use slightly modified statistical techniques to deal with this. I'm going to discuss a few more topics that are relevant to the experimental method, and then we'll go over the example that is given in your textbook because I think it provides a very good illustration of this methodology. That being said, I highly recommend reading along in both the book and I have provided the actual empirical paper on iLearn. Now, the first thing is validity concerns. Validity refers to the appropriateness of a conclusion or a decision, and in general, a valid claim is reasonable, accurate, and justifiable. Now, oftentimes people will confuse validity with reliability, but these two things are not the same. One of the best sort of mental picture examples that I've come across is the idea of stepping on a scale. Now, you probably know to some degree how much you weigh, and if you stand on a scale and it shows you that weight that you are currently at, that is a valid scale. Now, if that scale always shows you 20 pounds lighter than you are, but it always does this, it is a reliable scale. It is just not valid. It is possible to be incorrect, but reliable. It is impossible to be valid and not reliable. If something is valid, it will most likely be reliable. Not most likely even, it must be so, because it is always showing you what is reality. Validity is how accurately something represents whatever it is trying to represent. While there are multiple forms of validity that we are concerned with when it comes to experiments, the two primary ones we will discuss here are internal and external validity. Internal validity refers to the degree to which nothing besides the independent variable can affect the dependent variable. This is ultimately accomplished by controlling all extraneous or miscellaneous variables and by randomly assigning people to experimental conditions. Basically what this means is an experiment is high in internal validity when we can be sure that only the piece that we modified or manipulated is driving the change. If there are all kinds of other possible explanations that can be presented for the change that we are seeing, this experiment lacks high internal validity. On the other side, there's external validity, and this refers to how well the results from a study can be generalized to other situations or other people. For example, will people in Japan operate in the same manner as people in the United States? If a study is able to speak to this, it has high external validity. Now, when we talk about controlling variables, what we mean is they're held constant across experimental conditions. If I wanted to see how quickly different age groups can eat an ice cream bar, I would need to keep the temperature in those rooms constant because it is possible that in warmer rooms, the ice cream would melt faster, causing people to naturally try and eat it before it dripped all over their hands. Here, temperature could ultimately provide an alternative explanation for the speed at which people eat ice cream, thus compromising internal validity. And so I would need to keep the temperature across the room in which all people ate the ice cream controlled. I would hold that temperature constant so that it does not affect the rate at which people eat ice cream, or more specifically, it would ideally affect all people in the same way. When I spoke about random assignment, I was referring to the process of ensuring that all participants have an equal chance of taking part in any condition. Now, this is a little bit different than random assignment. This just means that I have a group of people who come to take part in my experiment, and my experiment has multiple conditions, and so I randomly sort them into the various different conditions. 
An easy way to imagine this would be an experiment that has only two conditions, and you flip a coin, and based on the heads or tails of this fair coin, you put people into either group A or group B. This is done to minimize the chances of individual differences across participants, biasing the data that we obtain in our experiment. Now, it doesn't completely negate the possibility, right? It's possible to flip a fair coin 10 times and get 10 tails. It's just very unlikely for that to happen. Now, the underlying idea is that various individual differences, which will always exist, will average out across conditions. A good way to picture this would be to imagine sorting 100 random college students into two groups. What do you expect the various heights to look like in both groups? It is most likely going to be the case that you will have roughly equal numbers of tall and short people in both groups. In fact, if you average them together, chances are you would get two average heights for both groups that are relatively close together. Now, this is one of the main reasons why it is so important to have samples of sufficient size, because chances are, if you were only sorting four people into two different groups, you might begin to see much larger effects of individual differences. Whereas if I have a hundred people in either group, the effect of a single outlier, a person who let's say is seven and a half feet tall, is much less pronounced. Even though I have one person who is much taller than everybody else, on average, the two groups are going to have similar average heights. When it comes to laboratory versus real world settings, oftentimes laboratory settings do not approximate real life situations very well. I mean, how often, I don't know actually if you've taken part in a study, but imagine you were taking part in a flanker study, which is meant to study inhibition and our ability to focus only on relevant stimuli. Now, you can imagine that that's very important when we're driving around. You need to be able to ignore things that are not important or relevant to driving and pay much attention to all of the components that are required for being able to drive safely. The flanker has you look at a central arrow and has two arrows on either side of it, and sometimes the arrows are pointing in the opposite direction of the middle one. And your goal is always to respond left or right to that middle arrow. How many times have you done something like that in real life, other than in a laboratory setting? This is ultimately what we mean by they don't approximate real life situations very well. This is termed psychological realism, and it refers to the extent to which psychological processes triggered in an experiment, our ability to inhibit in the case I gave previously, are similar to the processes that occur in everyday life. So in that case, they're not that similar to actual driving. In order to increase psychological realism, researchers will often use cover stories, and a cover story is a description of the purpose of a study given to those participants that is different from the true purpose of the experiment and is used to maintain higher psychological realism. So for example, instead of using the conventional flanker, I could create a driving simulator and actually have people take part in this and randomly give them things to deal with that they should try and ignore. Here, I could tell them it's about driving even though it's actually about cognitive inhibition. This would allow me to have a higher degree of psychological realism. Finally, we have field experiments. And field experiments are a way to ensure very high external validity. And they do this because a field experiment is ultimately an experiment conducted in a natural setting rather than a laboratory. It gives high external validity because I no longer have to assume that what I discover in a laboratory will also be true in the real world. I am now doing my experiment in the real world, and therefore it stands to reason that this will represent what actually happens. Now it is important to note that managing extraneous variables, variables that we want to control, in a field experiment is very difficult and this tends to reduce the internal validity of such experiments. Now, another important thing to remember is that internal validity and external validity are often at odds with one another. As one increases, the other decreases. Because the more I control all of the variables, getting higher internal validity, the less likely that situation is to resemble the real world, lowering my external validity. But the more and more I do experiments in the real world, the less control I have over other variables coming into play. Just imagine doing an experiment in the real world where you had to have someone focus for 10 whole minutes and a pigeon flies right across their field of view. 
chances are they will be distracted for a moment. And controlling the flight paths of pigeons is probably not something you or any other researchers can do effectively. Well, there would be context, I suppose, but in a field study, it would be difficult. It is also not required that any one single experiment be high in both forms of validity. Rather, what researchers are prone to do is conduct multiple different types of experiments, each addressing certain types of limitations, and then aggregating the information together to build a more cohesive picture. Let's also talk about probability values, or more commonly referred to as p-values. Now, this is really important to understand because a lot of people make mistakes around this. The p-value is the probability value indicating the likelihood of obtaining the values on your dependent variable by chance. What this means is the likelihood of obtaining the results that you found if the independent variable you were testing had no effect on the dependent variable. This is really, really important. So when I get a p-value of 0 0.01, what I'm saying is there is a one out of 100 chance that I would see the results I got if that was not true, right? If the result I expected, the hypothesis I expected was not the case, I would still see those results one out of every hundred times I did that experiment. The p-value does not indicate the probability that something is true. It does not speak about truth, right? It does not. It also does not indicate that the inverse of the previous statement is true, right? You cannot do one minus the p-value and say that's the probability that something is true. Statistics does not work like that. There are also replications and meta-analyses to consider, and replications are one of the fundamental backbones of science. Now, a replication is the idea of repeating a study either exactly, which are called direct replications, or with particular or different participant populations or different settings, and these are oftentimes referred to as conceptual replications. By different participant populations, I mean you're trying it or experimenting or conducting the experiment on different people, for example, someone who lives in a different country, or in different settings. You change the temperature of the room, for example. Now, the results of many replications can be considered together using a meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is a statistical technique that averages the results of two or more studies to see if the effect of an independent variable is reliable. Another important thing to note is one of the best ways to get a very quick, fast overview of a current state of the field is to look up meta-analyses in that domain. I would, however, highly recommend looking up at least a couple different ones written by different authors, because oftentimes meta-analyses can be biased based on who's writing them and what studies they decide to include, because it can be difficult to find every single study conducted on a particular topic. Okay, let us now talk about the bystander effect, which is the example that your textbook uses to illustrate the experimental method, and I highly recommend reading it as I feel they do a very good job. The bystander effect refers to the finding that the greater the number of bystanders who witness an emergency, the less likely any one of them is to help. Now, where this started was in the early 1960s, a young woman named Kitty Genovese was fatally attacked outside her apartment. The number of witnesses is actually unclear, but it has been confirmed that multiple residents of the neighborhood either saw or heard the attack and her pleas for help. What makes the story even more tragic is that the assailant left after assaulting her the first time, she was still alive at that point, and then returned a short while later and proceeded to finish the job, which is pretty horrifying if you think about it, considering how that young woman must have felt lying there in that moment wondering why no one came to help. Now, Latan and Darley came up with the hypothesis that the more people who witness a crime, the less likely any of them are to intervene. Now, since they couldn't actually stage a murder in front of unsuspecting people, nor heaven forbid an actual murder, they had to come up with some type of paradigm that would allow them to test their hypothesis, but not also permanently scar or psychologically damage the participants who were in this study. 
they also made a causal claim. You see in the beginning, right? The less people who witness a crime, the more likely they are to help. And the more people who witness a crime, the less likely they are to help. We're making a causal statement that helping behavior is the direct cause of how many witness the crime. Because of this causal claim, they needed to use an experiment. Observation and correlational methods would be inappropriate here. So the way they conducted their experiment. Whenever a participant would show up, they would walk them through a hallway with multiple doors and show them into a room with an intercom. As they were walking through, they would indicate to the participants that there were other participants who were involved in this particular study in different rooms of a similar nature. Now, the experimenter indicated that there were five other participants, one in each of those rooms, and they also indicated that only one intercom would be active at any given time, such that it would facilitate their speaking, and also that the experimenter would not be listening into that conversation. Also, this was done to contribute to the ability for them to openly speak about what they were going to discuss. The specifics of the conversation related to problems they had encountered as they had gone into college. Now, after each participant had had their go, each of whom would get a two minute chance, I mean, sorry, each would speak for about two minutes on their problems, it would go through all of the participants, and then each of them would get a chance to comment on their peers' responses. Now, the actual participant always went last, and after speaking, the first participant comes on again to give their response to the earlier comments. Now, in their first speech, they had mentioned that they sometimes have seizures, and this had caused a lot of problems for them in college, and oftentimes those seizures were the result of stressful situations. Now, shortly after they start giving their response, they actually experience a seizure, which is broadcast over the intercom. If you'd like to look at a transcript of this, it is presented in your textbook. Now, just for a moment, think to yourself, what would you do in this circumstance? You're sitting there at a desk by yourself in a room. You've been chatting with these four other people for the last couple of minutes. I mean, not technically chatting, but listening to their problems and sharing your own. And then the first person comes on again and starts to speak and then has a seizure. What would you do? While I can't speak for any of you individually, it turns out that only 31% of participants actually went and helped this person. Now, please note right here that there was not actually somebody who was having a seizure, right? It was staged. Now, what about the claim, though? How do we know that the number of people witnessing has an impact on helping behavior? Well, first of all, there was only ever this single actual participant. All other people involved were not actually there. Their responses were pre-recorded, including the seizure. Now, in the original variant, as I have been talking about, there were supposed to be five other participants, and in that case, only 31% of people actually went to help. In another variant of the study, there were only three other supposed participants, along with the actual one. In this case, 62% of participants went to go help this person who ostensibly was having a seizure. When it was only the single supposed participant who was having the seizure, along with the actual participant, 85% of participants went to go help. Here you can see that as the number of witnesses decreases, the percentage of people who went to go help increases, directly supporting the original hypothesis. Now, the components of this experiment. The number of people witnessing the event was the independent variable. This is what the researchers were able to control. They were either five other people, three other people, or just a single other person they could directly control how many people were witnessing this emergency. The number of people who went to help, or the helping behaviors in this case, was the dependent variable. They were examining how the number of witnesses impacted helping behaviors, or the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. Now, this experiment also had high internal validity due to all other factors other than the number of participants, or supposed participants, being kept the same across all participants. They always came into the same room, they had the same intercom, they were the same temperatures in the room, the voices they heard were the same, even the recording of the seizure was identical across all participants. Now, that being said, this experiment has relatively low external validity. 
Well, how often do you sit in a room with an intercom and talk about your problems? Probably not that likely. In fact, many people probably don't use intercoms at all anymore. Anyhow, to address this, other studies were also conducted. In fact, the same authors conducted a field study in which they watched people come in ones and twos into a store and they witnessed someone steal a box of beer from that store as they had the clerk walk into the back. And they looked at when people were just by themselves, how oftentimes they reported this to the clerk versus when they were with someone else, how often they did. And here they found results that matched closely with what they found, such that when people were in pairs, they were much less likely to report the crime than when they were by themselves. In fact, these effects have been replicated multiple times over the decades. If you wanted to see a real life example, you probably can't do this anymore, but oftentimes if you write BART, people will faint around Embarcadero and West Oakland. It has to do with the pressure changes of coming out of the tunnel. And many a time you can just watch people stand around them as they have fainted before someone who probably has training will intervene. We will talk much more about this in, well, quite many chapters yet, but we will talk about it in detail. Finally, a quick note about applied versus basic research. Applied research refers to research conducted for the purpose of solving some particular real world issue, whereas basic research is research conducted for the sake of curiosity or knowledge discovery. Now, while people will often say they fit into one category or the other, the truth is most research consists of both. And so the distinction, in my opinion, is really not that helpful because much research done along basic side can be used then later in applied research, and lots of applied research can raise new questions that ultimately spark entire new fields of basic research. I leave how important that distinction is up to you.